Hi, and welcome to today's ISCA ICANN webinar series. My name is Lupe Hernandez. I'm a student success advisor at ICANN. Uh, today's topic is going to be about the financial aid process with students with special uh, circumstances or unique situations that might arise as you're working with, uh, with your high school seniors. In some situations, it might seem kind of tricky. So I'm going to cover a, a few of those special circumstances. Again, welcome. For those of you who are not familiar with ICANN, uh, we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, our mission is to empower Iowans to find success in career, college, and in life. We have various uh, uh, student success centers across the state of Iowa. Uh, I work out of Coralville or Iowa City location, and then I also have office hours um, in Davenport as well. So keep that in mind as you're working with your students. I am available in person in Coralville, uh, Iowa City, and also in Davenport. Uh, all of us, all of my coworkers, are also available um, at their designated student success centers and also virtually through Zoom. So keep that in mind. Um, the first thing I want to cover, the first unique situation I want to go over is working with non-citizen students. So the, this, this, there is a different, there are different situations um, that might arise with students who are not citizens of the United States. So let's start off with the first, the very first thing, which I think is very important. When you're talking with students who are not US citizens, do not use the term illegal or alien. Illegal alien is uh, derogatory. So uh, stay with uh, saying, you know, documented or undocumented immigrants. This is again, talking with students and about their, their parents as well, or guardians. Um, students who are not US citizens um, can apply and be accepted to college. Students who are um, undocumented, Okay, can apply and be accepted into a college, and they might also qualify for institutional aid based on their merit. All right, um, a lot of a lot of students in situations like this um, I, that I help with in the past have had to set up payment plans. So this is where a student who is undocumented, you know, they would take maybe a class or two per semester based on how much they can afford to pay out of pocket because they're paying out of pocket um, and set up a payment plan with the institution. Yes, it's going to take longer for them to complete their desired degree, but for a lot of these students, that's their only option because if they are undocumented, they are not able to file the FAFSA and therefore they do not qualify to receive federal or state money. Again, they might qualify for institutional aid from the college, but they would have to apply for it. And they might also qualify for some local scholarships that might help with, with, their, with their college costs. But again, that other option is setting up a payment plan. And again, in the past, when I worked with students in this situation, some of them, they might have a work permit or their DACA, so they can work. They're, they're working you know, full-time or part-time and they're taking classes as well. Um, as far as filing the FAFSA, you must be a U.S. citizen, a legal resident, or a U.S. national to file the FAFSA. So U.S. citizens include Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, and the Northern Mariana Islands, all right? Keep in mind, though, that all U.S. citizens are considered U.S. nationals, but not all nationals are citizens. This, this is important. So an example would be students who are from the Republic of Palau, Republic of the Marshall Islands, or the, Feder the Federated States of Micronesia. Students from these nations are not citizens, but they are able to file the FAFSA. There is a unique thing that they have to do in order to get through the FAFSA, but they can file it. Um, so again, the FAFSA is for US citizens, legal U.S. residents, which means they have a green card, or they are U.S. nationals. All right, so let's talk a little bit more on students who are undocumented. So only the FAFSA applicant needs to be a U.S. citizen or a legal resident. So this is sometimes, this is a subject that comes up a lot. 
Sometimes students will say, you know, I have a green card or I am a U.S. citizen. I was born here in the U.S., but my parents are not. My parents are undocumented. That doesn't matter. The parent's immigration status is not considered on the FAFSA. So they will not ask for the parent's um, uh, immigration status on the application. Sometimes, though, which understandably so, parents or families or students, they are concerned, they're nervous. You know, if I do the FAFSA and my parents are undocumented and I put in their information, will they be reported to immigration? And the answer is no. The Department of Education and colleges do not report to INS or Immigration and Naturalization Services. So assure your students, as long as you are a U.S. citizen or you have a green card, you're a legal resident, your parents will not be deported, okay? Because they're not the ones applying for financial aid. You are. You, the student, is the one applying for financial aid. Now, this is where it gets tricky, though. So, okay, the student is a, is a U.S. citizen or a legal resident, but the parents are not. You do have to report the parent's income. All right, and this gets tricky because some parents uh, get paid cash. They don't have an actual W-2. Or some parents use a different name to work, all right? So this is where it gets, it starts to get a little bit more tricky for, for, this, for the students. So what I would advise if the situation arises is yes, you need to report how much the parents made. What's gonna make this a lot easier for the student is if the parents, even though they're undocumented, that they still file taxes. And in order to do this, they need to have an I-10 number, an individual tax identification number. Parents, families can apply for an I-10 number using a form called the W-7 form. It is free through the IRS, the IRS.gov. This is gonna make filing the FAFSA for your student a lot easier because it's tracked, their income is tracked. And if the college selects the student for verification, there is documentation stating this is how much the parents earned, even though they are not US citizens or legal residents of this country. If a parent is undocumented, they cannot set up a federal student aid ID, so they can they don't have an FSA ID, they can't. For the social security number, when it asks for the social security number, you're gonna put zeros. All right, so zero, you know, nine zeros or eight zeros, however long the social security number is. And to sign the FAFSA, they have to print a signature page, physically sign this document, and send it into the Department of Education. So that's how you get by doing the FAFSA for a student who is a, a citizen or a legal resident and the parents are or not, okay? So students who are legal residents, it means that they are non-citizens, okay? They're legal residents of the United States. Um, they are lawful permanent residents. They are also known as green card, green card holders. Um, they are they're authorized to live permanently in the U.S. They can travel. FAFSA, the FAFSA will ask for the green card number. So this is what the green card looks like. And where the blue arrow is, that's the USCIS number that you need to report on the FAFSA. Usually it starts with a zero. Sometimes it starts with a two, um, but that's where you're gonna look. Also, when you're looking at the student's green card, make sure that you're also looking at the expiration date. Students who have a green card, who are legal residents, have to renew their application, I believe every 10 years. Okay, so just make sure that it is up to date. If they have a green card, it means they also have a social security card, which you're gonna need also to file the FAFSA. So just remember, this is what the green card looks like. If a student um, says, I have a green card, this is what they need to show you. This is the information that you're gonna need in order to complete the FAFSA, All right? Okay, so now we start to get a little bit more complicated. So students who are uh, under DACA, protection. DACA stands for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. These individuals are protected from deportation, so they cannot be deported to their home country. Uh, students under DACA are called dreamers, 
Okay, this program does not grant them official legal status or a pathway to citizenship, but it, do, but it does allow them to apply for a driver's license, a social security number, and a work permit. Please, please make sure that when you're talking to students and they say, oh yeah, I have DACA. A lot of young people that I've met that have DACA, they think that they can, they can, um, that they, can file the FAFSA and get federal financial aid because, because they get an actual social security card. They get an actual social security card and they're able to get a driver's license. And a lot of them, a lot of them don't realize that yes, you have a social security number. Yes, you can work, um, but you will not qualify for federal financial aid. Okay. I would advise you, I advise all students under DACA, do not file the FAFSA if it's not needed, okay? Let me go further into this. There are some colleges that if a student is under DACA, the college understands that in the state of Iowa, they will not qualify for federal or state aid, but there might be some institutional aid that they might qualify for from the college itself. So then they will ask the student, you know, do, do your FAFSA. If this happens, please make the students aware that they can do the FAFSA, they can file the FAFSA, but it's only for that particular scholarship that, they, that, they're, that they're doing the FAFSA for. Some students have their hopes up because they do the FAFSA and then it, you know, it's, it's, oh, they think, oh, I'm gonna get federal and state aid. That, that's not the case. That's only do the FAFSA if it's required for a scholarship. If it's not required, there is no reason for students in the state of Iowa to file the, the FAFSA form. All right, another thing that might come up, um, students who are not non-citizens, they're not DACA, but they are under TPS, Temporary Protection Status. So this is a humanitarian solution for migrants who are unable to return home safely. Okay, so this usually when I see this, it's families from students from Central America. Okay, if they are under TPS, they will have a card that looks like this, right? And where you see it circled in a little arrow there, a category C-19, it means that they're under TPS status, right? That means that they can live in the United States and work in the United States, but that is all. This is where it gets confusing for young, some young, some young people who are under TPS because again, they actually get a, they actually get a social security card. So they think, oh, I have a social security number. You do, but that's only to work and to file taxes in the United States. But they, again, do not qualify for federal or state financial aid. All right. And then undocumented students. So undocumented students are in the US without any legal documentation. Be cautious with this because some students are not aware that they're undocumented because they were brought to the US as infants or children. Um, this might be a little uncomfortable in a comfortable situation. Again, I, if the student is not aware that they're not US citizens, uh, this is a conversation that needs to be had with the family, of course. If this is a, this is, if this is a situation that you come across, mention the possibility of applying for DACA. If a, uh, if a student um, is currently enrolled in school, high school, has graduated from high school, obtained a, a certificate of completion or a GED, uh, or has been honorably discharged from the, uh, from the US government, they qualify for DACA. The biggest thing though, the immigration lawyer that I sometimes contact about questions like this, the biggest thing is that these students who want to apply for DACA, they must have not been convicted of a felony offense a significant misdemeanor offense, multiple misdemeanor offenses, or other or otherwise pose a threat to national security. This is very important because lawyers can use this against the students. So any little thing, even if you're like, even if the student's like, I got a speeding ticket, or you know, I got into a fight. Though if it's reported to the police, it's going to be on their record, which could affect their DACA application. 
The cost of um, applying is $495. And this needs to be renewed every two years. And the renewal costs the same as the initial application. It's $495. The best piece of advice that I can give you in situations like this, give them general information just to get the ball rolling, but always advise them to speak to a lawyer before starting the process. You or, I don't know about you, but I think most of us are not immigration lawyers. So we, we do not know the laws and the rules for things like this. So we all we can do is provide it the information, the limited information that we have, and then give them the resources that they can use to continue that process. A few resources that I was talking about. Um, these are some of the websites that I have used in the past. So this, the first two are uh, national websites. So the dream.us is a really good resource, has scholarships for students under DACA status. It has up-to-date information on students who are dreamers. So now if you check them out, my undocumented life, similar, but it's for students who are undocumented. Um, it has information about um, applying for scholarships and just resources for students who want to attend college but don't have any type of documentation in this country. Dream Iowa is our local uh, dream um, organization, all right? They actually have a scholarship. Um, what day is today? Um, they have a scholarship this year. It was due May 15th, um, but definitely check them out. Again, uh, information on scholarships and just information that needs, that students should know about their, their situation. The um, State Office of Latino Affairs is a really good resource for in situations like this. And I have used this PDF document in the past. This is a list of immigration lawyers in the state of Iowa. So, like I said, give the student the informa enough information that they need to help them with the next step. But again, none of us are, at least I'm not. I am not a lawyer. I am not. I, I don't know the specifics, so just make sure that they are contacting professionals that can give them accurate professional guidance with these types of things. Okay, moving on to a different special circumstance. This has to do with the dependency status with the student. So for the FAFSA, um, most students are considered dependent, which means that parents' information has to be reported on the FAFSA form. So if a student answers no to all of these dependency questions, it means that parents' information has to be provided. Sometimes parents will say, well, what if, um, what if I don't claim them on my taxes anymore? What if they don't live with me anymore? What if I don't plan to help them with college? They're on their own. It does not matter. If the student answers no to all of these questions, they are considered dependent and parents' information has to be provided. Most students that I work with are dependent, so parents' information has to go in there. But there are some special circumstances where a student can file as an independent. So let's go over that. So the first one, um, the first situation that I'm gonna go over and that's a special circumstance is a student has or will have a child that they will financially support more than 50% of the time. So if a student is um, has a child or will have a child within that academic year, um, they must show that they will provide more than half of the child's financial support. The college will ask for documentation. The college will ask for, you know, do you pay for rent? Do you pay for food? Do you get food stamps? Do you get WIC? Do you get Medicaid? Um, so just be aware that if a student answers, yes, I have a child that I will financially support, the college will flag the FAFSA and the college will ask for documentation to, to show that the parent indeed, the student indeed provides more than half of the financial support for the student, for the child. Another situation that comes up is legal guardianship. Okay, um, sometimes students will say, you know, my grandma has a guardianship of me. This must be court appointed. A notarized document will not suffice. And this is, I come across this often, 
where grandma or uncle or someone um, will say, so, you know, so-and-so is my guardian, but it wasn't court appointed. It was literally a note that was notarized and, you know, they, they that's legal guardianship. It has to be court appointed. And again, the college will ask for documentation. It gets tricky though, <laughs> where when the parents are outside of the country. So I have this come up often, not often, it's, it's rare, where the students are here, they're US citizens, um, but the parents are in another country. Usually it's in Mexico or in Africa or somewhere else. And then they say, well, my aunt has guardianship of me, but they really don't. It was just a verbal agreement or just something in a piece of paper that says, I will take care of your child, you know, while they're here. This is where you need to contact the college and ask for, for guidance on, on, on the situation because it's, it's a difficult situation and it was not court appointed. So the, the college will be a much better guidance on, on what to do. And more than likely, the parent's information has to be provided. Even though they're in a different country, we still have to provide their, their demographic information, their income, um, in order to move forward with the, with the FAFSA application. Sometimes students will be a ward of the court. This refers to a foster child in the custody of a public child welfare agency. Again, the college will ask for documentation. Just if you haven't noticed already, there is a theme here. So whenever, whenever the student says, yes, I am a legal guardian, I am under legal guardianship, I am a ward of the court, I am a foster, the college will ask for documentation to prove their, their, ind their independent status. Um, foster care, okay? So if a young person was in foster care for even, even one day after their 13th birthday and they can provide documentation of their foster care status, they could file as an independent and they could potentially receive more financial aid, okay? Now, those who are adopted go back to needing to provide adopt, adoptive parent information on the FAFSA form. Okay, so foster care youth uh, would be able to file as an independent if they were in foster care, even if it was one day, okay, that after their 13th birthday. Homeless or unaccompanied youth. Um, these would be students who lack a fixed, regular, or adequate nighttime residence. Uh, sometimes, or I've met students in the past where they've been kicked out of the house for whatever reason, they're staying at a friend's house, they're couch surfing, all right? Um, this, this, would be, this would be considered homeless or unaccompanied youth. Um, the McKinney-Vento Act, students who, who fall into the McKinney-Vento Act would be considered homeless or unaccompanied youth. Um, in situations where students are homeless or risk of becoming homeless, Colleges might ask for a statement from the school counselor or the school district homeless liaison. Um, again, just like previous situations with foster care, with guardianship, with board of the court, the colleges will ask for documentation. They're going to ask for docu They're going to ask for documentation from from a homeless or unaccompanied youth um, situation. They're going to ask to talk to, or they're going to need a written statement from the school counselor or the school district homeless liaison. So. If you have a student that falls into one of these situations, um, always run it by the college. Always communicate with the college for unique situations. They have the last word. And please, please know that colleges are going to treat situations differently. This is very important for those students who are considering different colleges. So if they're like, oh, I'm considering three schools. Some one school might treat the situation differently than the second school. So this is this is, I think, sometimes even more pressure for the student to kind of decide where are you going to be going for real for college because whatever this college says is what is what we're going to go with. So this is just more conversation that needs to be had with the student. Um, when you contact the college, you would ask to speak to a financial aid advisor regarding a special circumstance request or a dependency override. We at ICANN, again, can guide you and give you general information about certain situations that are unique to the particular student. But again, we will always go with what the colleges say. The colleges will always have the last word on how to treat a unique student with a, with a special circumstance. 
So a few resources um, available to you, of course, through the Iowa College Aid Commission, they actually have a voucher, an education training voucher. So this provides awards of up to $5,000 per year for students who age out of foster care and students who are adopted after the age of 16. The All Iowa Opportunity Scholarship, um, and they, students in foster care are given priority for the All Iowa Opportunity Scholarship. For more information on resources through the state, definitely go to iowacollegeaid.gov. All right, um, I hope this was beneficial to you. I hope it was useful. Um, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. Um, this is our toll-free number. You can schedule online. Um, I am available, of course. This is my direct phone number and my email. Uh, I do speak Spanish, so feel free to share my information with your Spanish-speaking parents and students. Um, because we are able to do virtual appointments, I have a farther reach. So even though I am in Eastern Iowa, I can definitely help students all over the state from Western Iowa or anywhere in the state. Um, so definitely please uh, share my information. If you have a unique situation with a student, um, please let us know and we'll be more than happy to help in any way that, that we can. Thank you for joining. Have a good day. Bye.